Hello there, true crime lovers. I'm Kimmy, and I am the host of this podcast, Always Talking Crime. Now, as promised, I am bringing you a gruesome story of an Australian criminal today. Um, All thanks to the fact that I've got some Australian listeners. I'm super excited about that. And Iceland is in the house. So welcome, Iceland. Um, I'm super, super excited that this community and this podcast keeps growing. Please continue to share it, um, follow, um, hit that follow button, um, review, rate and review my um, podcast if wherever you listen to it allows you to do so. Share this with a friend. If you have friends that are true crime lovers, oh my gosh, let's just keep this thing growing because the bigger it grows, the more episodes I can give you guys every week. Um, I'm already you know, working on some plans to roll out a couple extra episodes for those who want them in May. I will be giving you more um, information about that probably at the end of this episode or on the next one. But we've only got this episode and one more to go until it's May. I love May. Um, It's just one more month closer to my favorite month which is june that's my birthday month so june 1st hits and i pick up that invisible birthday crown (laughs) and place it on top of my head but guys like i wanted to tell you that may is going to be a crazy ass month because as we know um in may Um, we celebrate Mother's Day. So I'm going to be giving you, oh my gosh, I've been researching so many cases involving um, killer moms or moms that are murdered. And um, I'm going to be bringing you quite a few of those stories next month. So get ready for that. It's going to be totally crazy sometimes um, super heartbreaking even like I'm not even going to give you guys any hints. But On Easter Sunday, I was watching a documentary about one of the cases I'm researching, and I literally could not stop crying. So I'm still kind of tossing around the idea of whether or not I can get through recording an episode about this, but um, I sure am going to try um, because it's it's a crazy one. Um, I also, before we get started, I wanted to holla out at my top five states as far as listeners go. Um, The most listeners are from Florida, obviously, and that's probably because I live in Pensacola, Florida, and a lot of my friends and um, acquaintances, you know, listen to this podcast, which is amazing. So thank you all, my Floridians, for um, supporting me and listening to this podcast. Like, you guys are amazing. And then um, second runner up um, is Wisconsin. Hey, Wisconsin. And third is Ohio. After that, we've got Georgia. And in the number five slot is Texas. So, um, yeah, I know I did the Ed Gein case, you know, which took place in Wisconsin. But I'm going to have to start looking out for some more cases from some of those states for sure. But I am so happy that you guys are all listening. As always, if you have any case requests, if you have any comments, if you just want to, you know, shoot the shit with me, send me an email at always talking shit or always talking crime podcast at Gmail or um, message me on my Instagram. It's always talking crime podcast. I'm super excited. I almost like told you my other podcast. I'm on hiatus from that podcast. I do have another one for those who um, just like podcasts that are about all the shit. (laughs) I have a podcast called Always Talking Shit. And that's also here on Podbean. And it's also on Spotify. I have not put it out on any other platforms yet. And like I said, I've been on hiatus from that since I think it's been like the beginning of March. Um, So I'm getting ready to record some new episodes of that one as well. Pluggity plug plug plug. So I talk a lot about 
some of my life struggles, some of the situations I've been through. Um, I try to do it all with a sense of humor. I tell you all funny stories. I talk about shitty jobs I've had. I talk about shitty relationships that I've had. I talk about fuck boys that I've met. I mean, um, nothing really is off limits. I spend a lot of time, you know, discussing um, some of the family dynamics and some of the... Um, just the dysfunction in like my childhood and my family. Um, I try to be motivating. I try to be positive. I try to uplift people. So if that is your jam, make sure you check that one out as well. Like if you get bored in between my true crime episodes, um, I'm all for you hitting me up on my other, on my other podcast. Um, but anyways, let's get this party started. guys so i know you already saw the title of what this episode is going to be about um i will list list my case sources um on the the notes for um on the podcast wherever you're listening you're going to be able to see where i got all my information and um i'm also going to be listing a kind of like a documentary that i watched about her i believe it was on amazon um, Amazon Prime and um, yeah it was crazy because you were able to see um, some of it was dramatized but you were able to see a lot of the photos and everything of the crime scene and how gruesome it was and you're able to like hear you know the police who showed up at the crime scene describe <laughs> what they saw and how they felt when they saw it so anyways let's get down to business this is the story about Catherine Mary Knight, who is also dubbed the Butcher from Down Under. Now, like I already said, it's a gruesome story. Um, Mary Knight was a large bully of a woman. She was overly sexual and had numerous lovers throughout her, her lifetime, I guess. I mean, she probably isn't fucking anybody now but well she could be <laughs> but she didn't take shit from anybody she had a very short temper as you're going to hear and she resorted to physical violence whenever she felt wronged by someone mary knight was also the first australian woman to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole so they locked her up and threw away the key Catherine Mary Knight was born on October 24th, 1955, and she was raised in an incredibly dysfunctional and abusive family. Originally from the town of Aberdeen in New South Wales's Hunter Valley, Catherine's mother, Barbara Rowan, was forced to move to a place called Moree after being caught having an affair with a man named Ken Knight who he was actually, Ken Knight was a friend and co-worker of Barbara's husband, Jack Rowan. So, bad, bad Barbara. Anyway, she got caught, and the Rowan and the Knight families were both super well-known in this conservative rural town, and this affair was quite a, like, major scandal. Barbara and her husband, Jack, had four sons together at this point. When Barbara relocated to Maury, two of the sons remained with their father, while the two youngest sons were sent to live with an aunt in Sydney, Australia. Catherine Knight was the younger of twin girls born to Barbara and Ken on October 24th of that 1955. Was it 1955? I already forgot. Yeah, 1955. Um, but Jack Rowan died in 1959 when Catherine was four years old. So she was just real small. And her two brothers that had lived with Jack moved in with their family in their household. So now it was 
it was her and her twin sister. And then I think there were two other sons that um, Barbara and Ken Knight had together. And then the other two boys came. So in total, there were six kids plus the, the mom and the dad. So it was a full house for sure. Knight's father, Ken, was an alcoholic, and he openly used violence and intimidation to rape her mom up to 10 friggin' times a day. I mean, that's a lot of raping. I mean, a lot. Like, even one time a day is one time too many, but up to 10 times. I can't even fathom it. And um, Barbara, in turn, often told her daughters intimate details of her sex life and how much she hated sex and men. And I, I almost forgot to mention that Catherine's dad would not only rape her mom up to 10 times a day, but many times he would rape her in front of the children, which just makes me want to fucking hurl. That's why I have a drink here. I have a, um, it's a Jack Daniels watermelon punch, a little bottle of it. It's kind of like a wine cooler, <laughs> but I had to have something to drink. I was just drinking a, wa- a bottle of water and I thought, nope. I need a little bit of alcohol to get through this story. And I don't have any Australian beer or Australian wine. Sometimes I drink Australian wine. It's pretty good. Um, There's a couple brands I like. But I don't think I've ever tried Australian beer. But I should have been more prepared and went out and got something, huh? (laughs) But anyways, um, later on, Knight complained to her mother like, you know, when she was an adult, she complained to her mother, Barbara, that one of her partners wanted to take part in a sex act that Catherine really didn't want to do. And her fucking mom told her to, quote, put up with it and stop complaining. Knight Knight claims that she was frequently sexually abused by several members of her family, though she specifically said that it was not by her father. So... I don't know. It doesn't, you know, no, nobody ever said like who it was, but I'm assuming that it was probably the two older brothers or the half brothers that came to live with the family after their dad had died. So I'm just putting two and two together. You know, I'm not making a claim that that is correct, but just in my mind, I'm thinking that's, you know, pretty much what makes sense. But anyways, the abuse that she was suffering, the sexual abuse continued until she was 11 years old. So those boys moved in to the household when Catherine Knight was only four. So roughly, you know, for up to seven years, she, you know, was being sexually abused. Although they have minor doubts about the details, psychiatrists accept her claim because all of Catherine's family members confirmed the abuse did indeed happen. Based on her behavior, it's clear that there was something that had to have happened to her to mold her into the horrendous woman she had later become. Like, when you hear, like, you'll be like, yes, something definitely fucking happened to that woman and it had to have been bad um, because she's just disgusting. Apart from her twin sister, Joy, the only person Catherine was close to was her uncle, Oscar Knight, who was a champion horseman. She was devastated when he committed suicide in 1969, and she continues to maintain that his ghost visits her. The family moved back to Aberdeen that same year. Catherine was, by all accounts, a pleasant girl who experienced uncontrollably murderous rages in response to things that other people would consider, like, just minor. When she attended Muswell Brook High School, she became a loner and is remembered by classmates as a bully who stood over the smaller children. She assaulted at least one boy at school with a weapon and was once injured by a teacher who was later found to have only acted in their own self-defense. By contrast, when not in a rage, Catherine Knight was a model student and she often earned awards for her good behavior. On leaving school at the age of 15 without having learned to read or write, which is crazy, how can you be like 
in school until you're 15 and you never learn how to read and write at school. And I know nothing about the Australian school systems. I didn't take the time to try to do any research on like what their um, curriculum is. But um, I don't know. That's just crazy to me that she was able to be in school all those years and, you know, she was illiterate. But anyway, she gained employment as a cutter in a clothing factory after she dropped out of school. 12 months later, she left to start what she referred to as her dream job, taking after her father, Ken, and working at the local abattoir, which is um, a slaughterhouse. Like, we call it a slaughterhouse here in the States. I don't even want to think about it. But, you know, that is what we call it. But in Australia, they are called abattoirs. Catherine was in charge of cutting up offal, which is the entrails and scrap meat from the carcasses that are slaughtered. If this isn't enough to make me be a vegetarian, <laughs> I don't know what is. Um, yeah, because this is ugh, just thinking about all this ugh, is nasty. Um, she was quickly promoted to boning <laughs> and 12 year old Cammie's got to get a chuckle out of that one. But anyways, she was promoted to boning <laughs> and given her own set of butcher knives. These knives would quickly become her most favorite possessions. At home, Catherine hung the knives over her bed because that's what everybody fucking does with their butcher knives, right? <laughs> okay, so she's a freak. She hung the knives over her bed so that they would always be handy if she needed them. A habit she continued until her incarceration at every home she lived in. So weird. All right, so now we're going to talk about the first relationship, okay? Um, Catherine first met hard-drinking co-worker David Stanford Kellett in 1973 and completely dominated him. If David got into a fight, Catherine would step in and back him up with her fists without fail. In Aberdeen, she was well known for beating anyone's ass if they upset her. So everybody was like very, very... Um, they all knew that and everybody like watched out, you know, nobody, everybody's probably like walking around like on eggshells around this bitch. Catherine married David in 1974 at her request. So homegirl was doing all the proposing, you know, she didn't even, she couldn't even wait for him to maybe propose to her. On their wedding day, the couple arrived at the surface, on, at the on their wedding day, the couple arrived to their wedding service on her motorcycle with a very intoxicated David Kellett riding bitch on the back seat. The visual of this in my mind is totally hilarious, though. I mean, come on. Like, she does the proposing. She's driving the motorcycle. He's the bitch on the back. It just, it's fucking hilarious. But as soon as they arrived at Catherine, oh, as soon as they arrived at the wedding, Catherine's mother, Barbara, gave David some really like peculiar advice, like so weird. This is what Barbara chose to say to her new son-in-law. Quote, you better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll fucking kill you. I can't imagine. Like, if I married a guy and his mom he said something like that to me, like, um, yeah, I would, I would be like runaway bride for sure. <laughs> That's just so messed up. And that, um, that turned out, that turns out to be true. So like just foreshadowing, I mean, is her mom wasn't wrong. Let's just say that. But Barbara went in to tell him that, you know, Catherine has a screw loose somewhere. On their wedding night, Catherine tried to strangle him. Like on their wedding night. That's, that's like, Honeymoon was over by that point. She later explained to him that it was because he fell asleep after fucking her only three times. What the fuck? Apparently, Barbara, her mom, had shared the fact that Catherine's father had had sex with her five times on their wedding night. So Catherine was extremely pissed that David could not perform to her expectations. So fucking weird. 
Their marriage was particularly violent. And on one occasion, a heavily pregnant Catherine burned all of his clothing and shoes before hitting him across the back of the head with a frying pan. This was all because he had arrived home late from a darts competition after making the final. So he was there longer than he planned to be or longer than he usually is. But fuck, it's like a competition. He made the final. So obviously he has to stay longer. Um, In fear for his life, David fled before collapsing in a neighbor's house. He was later treated for a badly fractured skull. Police wanted to charge her, but Catherine was now, of course, this is what abusers do. She was acting on her best behavior, and she talked David into dropping any and all charges against her. In May of 1976, shortly after the birth of their first child, whose name was Melissa Ann, David apparently found his balls. <laughs> he left her for another woman and moved to Queensland. He was apparently unable to cope with Knight's possessive, possessive violent behavior. And like, who could really blame him? Like, I'm surprised that he put up with it as long as he did. Because by this point, they were married for two years. That's the long ass time when you're getting your ass beat. Because she literally beat the fuck out of this guy all the time. The next day, Catherine was seen pushing Melissa Ann, her new baby, in a stroller down the main street, but she was violently throwing the stroller from side to side. She was admitted to St. Elmo's Hospital in Tamworth, where she was diagnosed with postnatal depression, and she spent several weeks recovering from that. After being released, Catherine purposely placed two-month-old Melissa on a railroad track shortly before the train was due to come. Then she stole an axe from somewhere, went into town, and threatened to kill several people. Like, she's just, like, insane. She was swinging the axe around and just screaming at people on the sidewalk in the middle of town. A man, good thing, a man known in the area as Old Tad was foraging nuts and berries near the railroad tracks and he found and rescued baby Melissa like literally just minutes before the train was going to come. Catherine was arrested and again taken to St. Elmo's Hospital, but apparently recovered, signed herself out the following day. Like, I don't understand how that happens. How does somebody do all of those things and then she just signs herself out of the hospital? I mean, if you're from Australia, let me know if this is how things still are over there. Or maybe it's just because this was back in the 70s and like... The 70s were cray cray. So maybe that's why all of this was, you know, happening. But oh my gosh, I need to know. Australian listeners, hit me up and let me know if it's this crazy over there now. A few days later, Catherine slashed the face of a woman with one of her knives and demanded that she drive Catherine to Queensland to find David. The woman escaped after they stopped at a service station, but by the time the police arrived, Catherine had taken a little boy hostage, and she was threatening the little boy with the knife. She was disarmed when police attacked her with brooms. Is that what is that what police do over in Australia? They like attack criminals with brooms instead of like guns and and tasers. <laughs> but anyway, she was admitted to the Morissette Psychiatric Hospital this time. Catherine told the nurses that she had intended to kill the mechanic at the service station because he was the one who had repaired David's car, which in turn had allowed him to leave her. Like this was her mindset. So she was blaming the mechanic at the service station. If the mechanic would not have repaired David's car, David would not have been able to leave her. Catherine was then planning to kill both David and David's mother when she arrived in Queensland. Who is ready to have another WTF moment with me? (laughs) When police informed David of the incident... He left his girlfriend, and he and his mother both moved back to Aberdeen to support Catherine. What the fuck? Catherine was released on August 9th, 1976, into the care of her mother-in-law and David. And they now moved to Woodridge, a suburb of Brisbane, 
Brisbane, I think it's Bris, Brisbane, where she obtained a job at the Dinmore Meatworks in nearby Ipswich. On March 6th of 1980, they had another daughter whom they named Natasha Marie. So it literally took them zero seconds to conceive another child when they got back together. Zero seconds. Because, you know, that's always the greatest thing to do. I mean, we talked about this in the Diane Dance um, case as well. Like, if you're having a shitty marriage or a shitty relationship, like, having a baby, bringing a child into the world is um, not going to make things any better. Most times, things are going to get worse. Like, way, way worse. Four years later, in 1984, Catherine left David this time and moved in first with her parents in Aberdeen and then into a rented house in nearby Muswellbrook, and that's where she went to high school. Although she returned to work at the abattoir, she injured her back the following year and she went on disability pension. No longer needing to rent accommodation close to her work, the government gave her a housing commission house like a residence in Aberdeen so she moved again back to Aberdeen all right now we're going to talk about the next guy Catherine met 38 year old minor David Saunders in 1986 we'll call him David too a few months after meeting you know it's really weird so when you're with somebody that's named the same thing as your ex I guess it makes it convenient because like if you're in bed together and you're like the kind of person who like screams out somebody's name during intimate moments, I mean, at least you're not going to worry about like saying the wrong name because, you know, both guys have the same name. So it made it pretty easy for her. But anyways, um, a few months after meeting David number two, he moved in with Catherine and her two daughters, although he also kept his old apartment in Scone. Catherine soon, of course, became really jealous regarding what he did when she was not around and would often throw him out of the house. He would move back into his apartment in Scone and then she would, you know, of course, follow him and beg for him to return, which he, he would. Super toxic. In May 1987, she, oh my gosh, okay, trigger warning guys, okay, um, go ahead a few seconds if you don't want to hear this, um, it involves an animal, it's super quick statement, um, but I just wanted to put that out there, like, if you don't want to hear this, skip ahead, like, not even 30 seconds, like, maybe 10 seconds, okay, um, in May 1987, she cut the throat of his two-month-old dingo pup in front of him for no fucking reason other than as an example of what would happen to him if he ever had an affair on her. Then Catherine knocked him unconscious with a frying pan. That bitch in frying pans. Like, ugh, that's just crazy. I would never even think, like, to hit my boyfriend or anybody with a fucking frying pan. I mean, just fucking ludicrous in june 1988 Catherine gave birth to her third daughter whom she named sarah which prompted david too to put a deposit down on a house which Catherine paid off completely when her workers compensation came through a year later Catherine decorated the house completely with animal skins skulls horns, rusty animal traps, leather jackets, old boots, machetes, rakes, and pitchforks. There wasn't any space, not even on the ceilings, that went, that were left uncovered. Like, bitch, like, had every wall and every ceiling covered in all this craziness. After an argument where she hit David, too, in the face with an iron before stabbing him in the stomach with a pair of scissors, he moved back to Scone. When he later returned home, he found that she had cut up all his clothes. So that part's a little bit funny because I did that to my ex-fiance before. I didn't cut up all his clothes, but that motherfucker was a true motherfucker. And I do remember 
being like super mad so I like picked out like five or six of his favorite work shirts <laughs> and I sliced and diced them with scissors and then hung them back up in the closet but yeah I will admit that that was crazy to do but that was a crazy five years of my life because he was like super insane and abusive had multiple personalities almost killed me a couple times but um yeah so that's that's what I did. <laughs> I'm not afraid to admit that I was crazy for a, a little while. But um, yeah, I would never like hit anybody with frying pans or irons or stab people in the stomach with scissors. Um, yeah. <laughs> David, too, took long service leave from work and went into hiding. Catherine tried to find him but nobody would admit to knowing where he was several months later david Chu returned to see his daughter and found that catherine had gone to the police and told the police that she was afraid of him they issued catherine with an avo which is an apprehended violence order so <laughs> They're like literally giving, they're protecting the wrong person, which is insane. So Catherine just went and fucking lied. All right. So that relationship's over. David and David too. Long gone. Bye bye. All right. So now we're going to talk about John Chillingsworth. Chilling, Chillingworth. In 1990, Knight became pregnant by a 43 year old farmer or former abattoir corp court worker Ugh, i'm getting all tongue-tied so a dude that she used to work with at the um abattoir um his name was john chillingworth like i don't understand how she can like just get like so many dudes to be interested in her because like i don't know if you um went and looked at the pictures on my instagram or on my facebook that i posted of this bitch but um Trying to say it nicely, this bitch is not cute. She is not cute at all. So if you did not see pictures of her yet, you need to fucking go to my Instagram or to my personal Facebook page. Um, it's posted publicly on there um, because she is not a very pretty woman. Not even on the inside. But apparently, um, from some accounts that I read trying to say this in a nice way and not um really like piggy but um there's no real there's no real like awesome way to say it but i guess she gave a good blow job and you know guys would always get back together with her after breaking up because of this fact so i don't know if it's true or not but um, that's what I've told. Either that or she has a pussy made of gold. But I don't, I don't know. So there's something about Catherine that, you know, the boys liked. Catherine gave birth the following year to a boy. She just keeps popping out babies. So um, they named him Eric. And their relationship only lasted three years before she left him for a man that she had been having an affair with for quite some time. And this guy's name was John Price. So she had David, David too. Um, she had John and now she has another John, but we won't call him John too because his nickname was actually Pricey. That's what everybody called him. So John Price slash Pricey, he was the father of three children when Catherine had had an affair with him. He was reportedly um, a terrific bloke. That's what people in Australia thought of him. He was liked by everyone who knew him, and his his own marriage had ended in 1988. I guess that he was still in love with his ex-wife. Like, he had not, even though, like, he was fucking Catherine and in a relationship with her, he was still, like, his heart still belonged to his ex-wife. While his two-year-old daughter had remained with his ex-wife, his two older children lived with him. Pricey was well aware of Catherine's violent reputation, but she still moved into his house in 1995. I don't know what the fuck he was thinking. His children liked her. He was making a lot of money working in the local mines, and apart from some violent arguments, at first he thought that life was like literally a bunch of roses. Like life was just awesome with her. 
1998, they had a fight over Pricey's refusal to marry her. I guess like she, um, she went and took a thousand dollars out of his account and went and like bought herself an engagement ring. Um, yeah. And then when he saw it, he was kind of like, well, I don't give a fuck if you went and bought yourself this ring. We're still not engaged. We are not getting married. So they had this huge, huge fight. And in retaliation, Catherine decided it was a good idea to videotape items that he had stolen from work and sent the tapes to his boss. And, like, these things weren't really items that were, like, stolen, per se. I mean, he took them from work, but... The items were out-of-date medical kits, like first aid kits, um, that were in the company's trash. So he just scavenged them from there. But even after being there for 17 years, they still fired Pricey from his job. So he lost his job and he lost his entire pension. That same day, Pricey kicked Catherine out of the house and um, Catherine had to return to her own home. So, good thing Pricey did that. Because, like, what the fuck? Like, that was a messed up thing to do. Like, I mean, he made a lot of money. And he had been there a long time. And, like, she just, like, fucked that up. So, now, Pricey didn't want anything to do with her. And his kids, like, started to hate her as well. A few months later, (laughs) Pricey decided to take a dumb pill in the morning. Because he restarted the relationship with Catherine. Although now he refused to allow her to move in with him. So they were dating but living separately. By this time, the fighting became even more frequent um, because Catherine wanted to live together. Catherine still wanted to get married. But then also, um, most of Pricey's friends would no longer have anything to do with him while they remained together. Like, they were like, dude, you're insane. You need to break up with this bitch. I don't care how good her blowjobs are. (laughs) You need to kick that bitch to the curb. And he wouldn't. In February of 2000, a series of assaults on Pricey culminated with Catherine stabbing him in the chest. Finally fed up, Pricey kicked her out of his house. On February 29th, he stopped at the Scone Magistrate's Court on his way to work and took out a restraining order to keep her away from both him and his children. So that was leap day of the year 2000. That afternoon, Pricey even told his co-workers that if he didn't come to work the next day, it would only be because Catherine had killed him. So he had gotten another job. He had to get a new job, all that kind of stuff. But he told the co-workers that that new job, like... If I don't show up, that means Catherine killed me. So his coworkers like actually pleaded with Pricey not to go home, but he told them that he believed that she would kill his children if he didn't show up at his house. Um, they didn't live together or anything, but like she would like be watching him and, and she would know like if he didn't go home and like there would be like vengeance. So Pricey arrived home to find that Catherine, although not there herself, had sent the children away for a sleepover at a friend's house, which is weird. Um, It makes me wonder, you know, what she had planned. She was probably going to try to romance him and, you know, try to get back in his good graces or something. I'm not really sure. Um, But that's just weird that she sent his children away for a sleepover. Pricey then spent the evening with his neighbors before he went home and went to bed at about 11 p.m. Now, earlier that day, Pricey did not know this, but Catherine had gone out and bought a, a new like piece of black lingerie and had videotaped all of her children while making like really fucking weird um, comments. Like... She was, t- she was making comments about what she was, like, leaving to each kid. So it had been since interpreted as some kind of, like, weird-ass, crude last will and testament or something. Like, she was going to kill herself or, like, thinking she was going to die. 
Um, later that night, Catherine arrived at Pricey's house while he was sleeping and sat watching TV for a few minutes. Then she took a shower and put on her little black lingerie and went in and woke up Pricey. And of course, they had sex. Um, what do men do after having sex? They fall asleep, of course. <laughs> um, and this is exactly what Pricey, you know, this is what Pricey did, okay? And that apparently did not sit well with Catherine. It, like, apparently pissed her off. At 6 a.m. the next morning, Pricey's neighbor became concerned that Pricey's car was still in the driveway. Um, and when Pricey did not arrive to work, of course, his co-workers were super worried. Um, and they sent, or the boss sent one of the co-workers over to the house to see what was wrong with Pricey. Both the neighbor and the co-worker tried knocking on Pricey's bedroom window to wake him up, but they had no luck. It wasn't long before they noticed blood on the front door and they alerted the police who arrived to Pricey's house at 8 a.m., Breaking down the back door, the police found Pricey's body posed upright in a living room recliner and Catherine was found comatose after taking a large number of pills. Catherine had stabbed Pricey with a butcher's knife while he was sleeping. According to the blood evidence, he awoke and of course, like you're not going to sleep through being stabbed. But he awoke and tried to turn the light on before attempting to escape while Catherine chased him around the house. Pricey even managed to open the front door and get outside, but he either stumbled back into the house or was dragged back into the hallway where he finally died after bleeding out. At some point, um, Catherine went into town and withdrew a bunch of money from Pricey's ATM account. Um, so there was a record of it, but they never found the money. Pricey's autopsy later revealed that he had been stabbed at least 37 times in both the front and back of his body with many of the wounds extending into vital organs. Several hours after Pricey had died. Okay, guys, this is super, super gruesome. So trigger warning if you're super squeamish um, most people that listen to true crime podcasts and watch true crime documentaries are not super squeamish but you know in the case that you are or if there's a child nearby um, you might just want to skip this part but um, I'm assuming that it's okay to go into details about this okay but um, we know that um, she had worked at that abattoir for a long time. Um, after Pricey had died, Catherine used her many years of skills by skinning him and then hung the skin from a meat hook on the open doorway leading into the foyer. So, let me um, paint a really nasty picture for you. So, she actually was so skilled that she completely skinned him from head to toe and it all came off in one piece which is just incredibly fucking nasty so this was basically the first thing that police had seen when they entered the home, but they had, re they had all reportedly thought it was a blanket or something like that hanging up in the doorway. And when they like walked past it, one police officer on the documentary that I was watching stated that it wasn't until he looked at his hand and saw that he had blood on his hand because he kind of like pushed the skin aside kind of like if you're going to push aside a blanket or like a curtain or something so that he could get through the doorway that's when he realized that it wasn't a blanket and it wasn't a curtain it was actually you know part of a person Catherine after doing that Catherine had then decapitated him she cut off both of his ass cheeks and cooked those cooked parts of his body so I mean I know, <laughs> like, the first thing, like, I always have to make jokes about stuff. I mean, 
I don't mean to be disrespectful because what happened to, to Pricey is terrible and, and I feel really, really bad for his family and, of course, for him, for the victim. But right away, like, um, what popped into my mind because I'm a sick person was somebody saying, Mom, this dinner tastes like ass. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, Catherine served up his ass cheeks with baked potato, pumpkin, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy. She put some onto two different place settings at the dinner table, along with notes beside each plate. And each of those notes had the name of one of Pricey's children on it. She was preparing to fucking like serve his ass his body his just his their dad to them like it's just so fucking disgusting a third meal was thrown on the back lawn for unknown reasons and um it is speculated that Catherine had attempted to eat it but could not and um this has been put forward in support of her claim that she has no memory of the crime so like she didn't know like how you know the other meal had you know ended up in out in the yard and stuff and then other reports had stated that she threw it outside for the dog to eat but like it literally had bite marks in it so I couldn't find any like true answer whether it was like um, teeth marks from a dog or teeth marks from a person but anyways, it was uneaten. It's like whoever had like tried to chew it or taste it like decided they didn't want it. So um, anyways, Pricey's head, this is even grosser. Well, I don't know. It's all gross. Um, Pricey's head, the decapitated head, was found in a pot with vegetables. The pot was still warm and it was estimated to be at between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius, which indicated that the cooking had taken place in the early morning. Sometime later, Catherine arranged the body, like the way they found it, um, in that chair. Um, the body was upright with the left arm draped open over an empty um, 1.25 liter soft drink bottle with the legs crossed. So she was like totally like making fun of him, making fun of his body, like just like beside like she desecrated his body in in every way possible um this was claimed in court to be an act of defilement demonstrating Catherine's contempt for pricey Catherine had left a handwritten note on top of a photograph of pricey it was bloodstained and covered with small pieces of flesh the note read, I'm going to read it to you, but keep in mind, like, she was illiterate. She could not read. She could not write, okay? So, um, I'm going to read you exactly, like, what it says, and then, in, like, whatever it's supposed to be, I'll, like, tell you what it's supposed to be, even though you could probably figure it out, because I know you're all smart people, but um, here we go. She wrote, time got you back, Jonathan, for rapping, raping, my daughter, daughter, daughter you too beck who was price's daughter for ross for little john who was his son now play with little john's dick john price the accusations in the note were found to be groundless like the letter made no sense so if he was like he was trying to say that um pricey had raped her daughter um and then Beck did something to Ross. I don't know who Ross is. Maybe that was... I, I, don't, I have no idea who Ross was. Um, who, who knows? It, like, she's a lunatic. So there is no way to make sense of what that lunatic was writing. So now let's talk about the trial. Catherine, Catherine's um, initial offer to plead guilty to manslaughter was rejected... And she was arraigned on February 2nd of 2001 on the charge of murdering Price, to which she entered a plea of not guilty. Her trial was initially fixed for July 23rd of 2001, but it was adjourned due to her counsel's illness, and it was like reset for October 15th of that year. When the trial commenced, Justice Barry O'Keefe 
offered the 60 jury prospects the option of being excused due to the nature of the photographic evidence, which five accepted. Like, five were like, fuck this shit. I am out. <laughs> which is probably what I would have done, too. Like, I would not want to see all of those pictures of Pricey's body. I, ugh. I don't mind, like, crime scene photos when there's not bodies involved, but, like, this was so brutal and disgusting. I don't, I don't think, like, once you see things, like, you can't unsee them. I know I've stated that in, like, other episodes previously. There's just some things that people are not meant to see, and this definitely would be on the top of my list. Um, anyways, when the witness list was read out to the prospects, several more also dropped out after which the jury was impaneled. Knight's attorneys then spoke to the judge who adjourned to the following day. The next morning, Catherine Knight changed her plea to guilty and the jury was dismissed. It was now made public that Justice O'Keefe had been advised of the plea change the day before. He had adjourned the trial and then ordered a psychiatric assessment overnight to determine if Knight understood the consequence of a guilty plea and to see if she was fit to make such a plea. Knight's legal team had planned to defend Knight by claiming amnesia and disassociation, which was a claim supported by most psychiatrists, although they did consider her sane. I it doesn't sound sane to me, but I guess like legally sane. No reason has ever been given for the guilty plea. And despite giving it, Catherine Knight still refused to accept responsibility for her actions. At the sentencing hearing, Knight's lawyers requested that Knight be excused to avoid hearing some of the facts about the case. But of course that application was refused because I'm sure like... I'm sure the judge was like, why, like, why would we let her be excused? Like, she's the one that fucking did all these things, you know? When Dr. Timothy Lyons took the stand and described the skinning and the decapitation, Knight became hysterical and she had to be sedated. On November 8th, Justice O'Keefe pointed out that the nature of the crime was um, so brutal and Catherine Knight lacked remorse, and he was going to um, give her a severe penalty. He sentenced Catherine Knight to life imprisonment, refused to fix a non-parole period, and ordered that her papers be marked, quote, never to be released, unquote. This was the first time that this had ever been imposed on a woman in Australian history, and rightfully so. Like, this like this bitch deserves to never be set free again because she would totally do this again, like, in another relationship, 100%. In June of 2006, Catherine Knight appealed the life sentence, claiming that a penalty of life in jail without the possibility of parole was too severe for the killing. Both justices, Peter McClellan... Oh, no, there's more than two. Okay, there's three. So, Justices Peter McClellan, Michael Adams, and Megan Latham dismissed this appeal in the NSW Court of Criminal Appeal in September, with Justice McClellan writing in his judgment, this was an appalling crime, almost beyond contemplation in a civilized society. So... I don't even think that Catherine Knight even gets to go outside. Um, I may be incorrect about that, but I thought I remembered reading or hearing that she's like just confined to her cell pretty much. And her cell is pretty much um, like a hoarder, <laughs> like what you would what you would expect a hoarder's cell to look like with like shit everywhere. I guess she does a lot of knitting, which is like super fucking weird that they would trust her with like knitting needle needles. But um, she's got like tons of knickknacks everywhere. I guess that everybody gets along really well with her. Like she's a peacekeeper and all the other prisoners like they call her Nana. So that's just wild to me. Like she was born um, 
a couple of years after my mom. So like she's in her late 60s, almost 70 years old. As we already know, she's never fucking getting out and rightfully so. But it seems like, you know, she's living the life in in the Australian prison and um, everybody respects her. Everybody loves her. Um, she's friendly with all the other inmates and it's just bizarre. I mean, she's on her best behavior. Like why couldn't she be on her best behavior when she was a free woman, you know, I don't know if they have her like medicated maybe, um, to make her, um, be nicer. I I don't know. I mean, and she's absolutely crazy. Um, but you could totally expect this amount of crazy from somebody who like, grew up the way she grew up. I mean, that's not giving her any excuses because other people have, like, grown up into super, like, abusive and um, controlling households and tons of domestic violence, tons of brutality. Um, So many things have happened to people and they grow up to be wonderful people so that's absolutely not an excuse somewhere along the way um I believe that Catherine Knight needed to be on some kind of medication for whatever kind of personality disorder she has I'm not a um, psychologist or a psychiatrist so I cannot diagnose what the fuck is actually wrong with this woman but um perhaps like being in prison she's been medicated and that's what's making her get along with everybody and make everybody like her so there's not been any complaints about her being violent in prison so um yeah guys that's the story that's the story of um Catherine Mary Knight (laughs) who was a wild one huh it's like super super disgusting she's like the like literal like real life leather face um Almost puts the Ed Gein story to shame, but yeah, that one's like equally disgusting. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm not sure what story I'm going to do next week. It'll be the last episode of April. I might do a survivor story. I might want to give you guys a story like with a happy ending for a change. <laughs> so um, I'm working on some notes on a couple of different things. Um, But I'm kind of thinking since May is going to be pretty horrifying and sad and gruesome and all the things talking about, you know, all the cases involving mothers. um, I think I might give you a a nice little happy survivor story next week. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And so some things that are going to be happening, I just want to let you know, um, Real briefly, I'll I'll talk more about this next episode. I am going to be starting a Patreon. And for those of you who don't know what a Patreon is, it's a way that you can support me with a monthly donation, if you would be so kind. And it's going to range in different amounts, and you're going to get some perks that go along with this. So, of course, you know, my, um, if you're just happy listening to my podcast the way you listen to it now, that is fabulous. I appreciate the support so much, as always. But for those of you who are like me and you're like a little bit obsessed with true crime and you'd like to maybe get your episode every week a day early, maybe you want to get it on Saturday instead of waiting until Sunday, you're going to have the opportunity to do that. Um, And then you can also decide whether or not you want to sign up to get either one extra episode per month or two extra episodes for per month. And those will be exclusive to Patreons. Um, some other things that will be happening when I start putting ads into, um, into the episodes, all the Patreons will get their episodes ad-free. Um, and then I'm going to be doing some giveaways. One of the tiers may include like discount on merch when merch becomes available. But I know that I am going to be doing a really, really awesome giveaway for the first couple of months um, that I start off the Patreon. I've already got this really amazing prize, which I'll talk more about next week 
or maybe in May, but probably next week. And I'll probably post something about it on my social. But yeah, I got something and I got one for my boyfriend too. And I was talking to the person who made them for me. And um, she can totally make one to give away to one of my patrons who signs up for my Patreon. So anyways, guys, I'll give you a lot more details on that. And then there'll be a link on the episodes on you know, where to find that and decide which tier you want to sign up for if you decide that you want to do that. But either way, I'm just happy that you're listening. I'm happy that you're supporting me. I hope you're having fun. I hope I make you laugh sometimes with my my little jokes. And I hope I make you go, oh, what the fuck, Um, at least 10 times or more every episode. Because, yeah, these stories, they can be brutal. So anyways, guys, I love you. I'm going to... um. I'm going to let you guys go now. It's a beautiful day outside. I always record on Thursdays um, because I have the house to myself. It's it's my day off from my J-O-B. So more often than not, this is the day that I get to record. And it's a beautiful, sunshiny day. And I know two cute little puppy dogs sitting next to me that would love to go out for another afternoon walkie. (laughs) <laughs> they just looked at me. They love their walkies. And on my day off, I like take them as often as possible. Uh, pretty soon, I'll be taking them to the beach because beaches love beaches and all that kind of good stuff. But anyways, guys, until next time, keep talking crime.